here are some of the considerations. Uh, these are considerations largely targeted towards customers on Kubernetes. And um, what my recommendations are is really use as few AWS proprietary services as part of doing that, because combining Terraform with your ephemeral environments, while it can be done, and I'll tell you how it can be done, I discourage it because it probably doesn't lead to the outcome you actually want. So what are some of the assumptions we want? Uh, we want these environments to come online fast. We don't wanna wait 45 minutes for our environment to come online because we did it the right way using Terraform, using RDS, using MSK. You know, RDS Aurora clusters can take like half an hour, 45 minutes to come online. MSK clusters, the same thing. So if we're trying to be you know, proper about this and deploy exactly what we have in staging and production for preview environments, we're on the wrong track. So that's why I say try and avoid some of these uh, managed uh, services uh, that have no open source analog or something that we can do containerized. I've heard interesting suggestions like what about using a local stack inside of Kubernetes so you can simulate and do it faster. I like the idea, we haven't done it. it sounds like one of those fun R&D projects. Again, the reason here isn't to conserve costs. I don't like that excuse. It's to, it's to actually deliver a better developer experience, uh, QA experience where these environments come online faster. So what do you do then if you can't use those? So like if you're using document DB, well, in, for your preview environments, you're gonna be deploying a MongoDB container. If you're using MSK, well, you're obviously gonna be doing the Kafka container. If you're going using Elastic Cache Redis, you're gonna be using the Redis container. Those come up in seconds. They don't take minutes and you're sticking within the whole uh, you know, uh, uh, Kubernetes manifest um, environment of uh, you know, writing YAML manifest. So if you still technically need to do AWS resources for these preview environments, well, okay, you can use Terraform. Like there's the, if you're on Terraform uh, Enterprise or Terraform Cloud, you can use the Terraform custom resource to provision stuff that way. It gets really kind of weird if you think about Kubernetes managing all this other infrastructure. And then also like if, if, if you're in a dev environment or you just, if you want to destroy that Kubernetes cluster, but that Kubernetes cluster now suddenly manages a lot of state outside of it. You, you actually have to be very proper about destroying everything that was provisioned inside the Terraform, inside the Kubernetes cluster before bringing down that Kubernetes cluster. I'm not, I mean, you should do that anyways. Uh, you know, maybe we take some shortcuts and we don't always do that. We just say, destroy cluster and worry about the rest. Uh, the next thing is if you are depending on things like the API gateway, uh, again, very similar to the other things, um, Dynamically working with the API gateway maybe means we're working with Terraform again, and that's the whole thing we're trying to avoid. So if you are using API gateway, how, how are you going to solve uh, updating it dynamically in this environment? Um, other considerations are these preview environments. Make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Is it, are you really trying to create remote development environments? Or are you truly doing it for QA, like validating that this pull request does what it said it was supposed to do before it goes into your develop branch or your trunk or uh, your main or wherever you're deploying. So, uh, because if, it's, if it is for, uh, for development, there may be better tools for doing this. Um, if you're in the Kubernetes uh, world, then that would be um, like scaffold or uh, garden.io or tilt.dev. Um, there are a few solutions there. And those are, uh, those are, I think, open core, most of the ones I talked about, and then there's some um, pay-to-play pay um, solutions for them. Then um, uh, the other important mindset shift here for your preview environments is that these are uh, not a replacement for your staging or QA environments for multiple reasons. One is we've just made all these concessions. We're not gonna use RDS, we're not gonna use MSK. So they're not really uh, proper analogs for a staging or QA environment. You're testing more of the functionality that uh, this pull request is supposed to deliver, but in terms of performance and, uh, and proper integration testing with the services, that's where these other environments uh, come into place. Uh, the last, consideration is um, a 
is a really interesting one because there's preconceived notions on what you want when you're saying you, you want to bring up all the related services for your application. Make sure you have had conversations with your developers or other stakeholders on what their expectations are. Like they might be thinking like, yeah, we want to bring up uh, this service at this version, this other service on this other branch at that version, this third service in another version. How are you going to capture those requirements of the versions of the services? And you might say the easy, the easy answer to this is just, well, in my pull request, I'm just going to update the, the environments file and say the versions I want. But if you're doing that, and then you have four other developers that are also doing that, you're, well, first of all, your pull requests are going to create conflicts on each other. And well, do you really want to be updating the version that gets merged into uh, the main branch? And well, if you don't want to do that, then you're going to want to have protections in place to prevent that from happening. Well, this is why uh, basically I think the best you can do is pick a convention like it's going to use the latest in main, or it's going to use the latest release we've deployed to staging or the latest release we've deployed to production. But having it, allowing every developer to cherry pick the versions, that's the non-trivial part uh, with this approach. So the other assumption um, that, uh, that has come to mind is that even how we think about microservices or service-oriented architectures isn't universal. And depending on how you are doing it, it's going to change how easy or hard your preview environments are. One pattern that I've seen at companies, uh, at a couple of companies, these are companies that have built their architectures around Golang, is they will actually be building a monolith where they can bring up this whole app as a monolith, but they can also De, uh, decouple it and deploy each service individually, even though it's the same exact code base, so they can scale it independently, but they can develop it as a monolith. And this is pretty interesting because then local development is really easy. Preview environments are really easy. And then you, but, but you know, staging and production, you can then break it out into multiple deployments that are scaled uh, independently. Um, I've also seen situations where companies have microservices oriented architectures. Why? Well, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> no questions asked, just do it. And then they end up not really understanding why you're supposed to do it. And they create these tightly coupled distributed monoliths that are also really difficult to operate. So I think the maturity of a company in their software development process, in their adoption of microservices really depends uh, or influences how well you can achieve preview environments. So where should you start? Well, maybe just go back to the drawing board. First, go through these questions. Two, tackle the easiest apps first that don't have any backing services. Maybe consider just tackling your spas or your React apps, your, you know, your front-end apps that can always just assume maybe that they can use the backend. Um, I think I'm, one thing we didn't even go into is like feature flagging and how that could be uh, helping you out implement these solutions by allowing code to merge into main um, and then have uh, the dependent services just use that feature. <laughs> Vlad is uh, giving a high five yeah, on that one. Yeah, and, um, and okay, yeah, service meshes and all that. Shit. So it, it is, this is a, this is a, it, it just turns out to be a much, bigger question than, uh, uh, than uh, I realized when I started thinking about it. Because when we first approached preview environments, we were like, yeah, we got this. This is easy. We just deploy it to its own Kubernetes namespace and we're done, right? Well, in the end, customers weren't always happy. And it's because there are all these other considerations that we were not uh, taking account for. Regarding creating like um, a distributed monolith of microservices, <laughs> Uh, I think this is a problem in in a lot of places that like the, 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 you find a service that has like seven dependencies and you can't test the feature without these seven services or five services and it really get, gets really complicated, especially when they are not connecting like they are not like AVIs or uh, like they are you know, like communicating through like uh, RabbitMQ or Kafka or, or any queue and things get really complicated because you can't like Use a uh, user shared staging environment uh, between them yeah. or something. Yeah, no, it's true. And then what hurts more is why did they? And then the reason for doing it there was really actually no reason they actually needed to do it. It was just done because 
of <laughs> industry standards, quote unquote. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing I've seen just uh, a, a method work for this in, in a very large, like more than a thousand microservices uh, type of environment mm -hmm. is using um, Kubernetes namespaces. So basically they had like a development environment where all the, all the services ran, but what, if you were working on a particular service that you wanted to test or do whatever, you, there was a way that you could pass in headers in your, in your call um, to redirect certain services to your own personal namespace um, instead of like, and then everything else would run in the main shared development namespace. So it's a pretty, uh, it was a pretty yeah, slick way of making it work. Yay for re-implementing feature flags in a terrible, disgusting way. Whoa. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. well it says, I think it is an interesting pattern. I haven't seen it effectively well, work yet, but... Um... So so let me just say that it is it is feature flags in a terrible way, but it's also in an environment where, like, there were, you know, hundreds of developers and... Um, you know, all these people making changes on all, all different things at the same time. So it was really hard to manage a, a centralized feature flagging uh, database at that point, but it's probably much easier now. So um, yeah, it maybe wasn't the best thing, but I've seen it at least work. Yeah. Uh, also, when I was working... Better? Okay, sorry, sorry, go on. Oh, no, please, sir, go ahead. Yeah, so... Um... Like uh, we try to not use uh, like AWS services, like 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 you said, like not use RDS, not use MSK, not use uh, the managed private MQ, but like for the S3 buckets, um, it was too hard to like create something. But we ended up like doing uh, a namespace buckets, so the code itself will yeah, yeah, exactly. will will use uh, namespaces namespace directories. And we tried to do it with, with Kafka, to be honest. Like we, we, we like made the code uh, itself use uh, namespace topics, but I'm not sure how this will scale. Uh, like I, I, I don't, like it, it works for now, but I don't, I'm not sure it will scale very well. Like, I, I like no, to I talk about a... like, oh, I just to... want to say, I think that's also a good consideration. We didn't, uh fairly say like i said like you don't want to use rds because it takes so much time to bring up the rds database well the alternative is you could also have a shared rds database uh cluster with multiple databases created dynamically for each preview environment and that's another alternative as well so this is on, something uh, that we do at, at at slideshare um where we we're fortunate to have a very simple uh rails based system and our for our preview environments uh, we we just use a shared staging environment, use the shared staging data set. So all the resources that the, all the backend resources that are ne that's just needed for uh, the monolith to, to consume are just shared. And so we don't have that concern. So like the underlying, com the complexity that we talked about in this, in this conversation, uh, we've kind of like, we don't have that problem. So we're able to simply just use that mesh to, to route to whatever the preview uh, we want to route to and so that's very convenient for us and that's a bit uh, it's very simple but one thing that we did in a previous company that I used to work for at Pivotal Software we had roughly 300 people across like you know like 15 17 micro, uh, service teams uh, who were constantly generating new features and building fixing bugs and um, you know making tweaks to the API uh, for their dependent services to produce Cloud Foundry, right? Um, and so the, the the main thing that was happening all the time was integration testing. Um, and this happened through just just uh, a very comprehensive set of, of uh, integration tests that would just run all the time with the latest builds of everything, right? And as soon as something went red, that would, you know, be a call to the product owner uh, to address that, uh, the compatibility issue and start, start that conversation. But it was a lot of work. It was just, we could not get around, uh, uh, the, the best that we could do was make it more efficient by having automated tests, uh, for integration. And that's, that's really, I think what's called for in your application for a complex, uh, multiple services that are need to, 
essentially this is a release problem, right? Uh, Vlad, I wanted to uh, give you a shot. You had something to add? Thank you, I promise I'm gonna be short. So I've been doing preview environment since I started with immutable infrastructure since 2016. They never work. <laughs> they require, <laughs> no, and I'm not kidding about that. This <laughs> is a management and a leadership failure. I'm trying to be nice about it, but that's it. We don't want to fix our release pipeline. We don't want to learn new ways of developing software safely. We don't want to stay up to date and learn. So we're going to fix this with infrastructure. Uh, so it gets very, even if you get to implement this and it finally works and you release it to your developers, you're going to hit a lot, a lot of problems. You're going to have to maintain database golden images. And congratulations, you now have the AMI hell again, but for databases, yeah. you are good. <laughs> to you share a database and share all the connections and give a database per tenant and your database is going to run out of connections and it's suddenly <laughs> going to not scale. You're gonna release this to your developers and every single developer will see, oh, this is so much helpful. I can create an environment for this feature that I'm working on and leave it there for, I don't know, QA to test a product to look at it and your cost is going to explode. And then you're gonna get pressure to actually fix that and it's not <laughs> fixable. Preview environments don't work. They were a good idea when we didn't have better tooling and we could throw money at the problem. Today, they still make sense for companies where this is already implemented, they're aware of this, it's a migration, it takes forever to happen. They work for front-end kind of, because front-end deployments are cheap. But I think that trying to do preview environments today instead of doing feature flags is a fundamental mistake and based on extensive experience building this will require a lot more effort a lot more money and a lot more involvement than you expect for little to no benefit i promise uh, i was going to uh, be short, so i was short. <laughs> i think that's a really interesting uh yeah uh, position as well, well and it's, uh, i'm glad you said it but i've i think that if you do it correctly instead of a scalable like it, it, if you manage the scope you don't have the problems that you've yeah you've manage the scope you've got to manage the scope, the scope. It never gets bigger it never gets more complicated and of course i can run my own database and load balancer and thing inside kubernetes and not use rds no, no stuff i'm saying if you manage the scope and, 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 you, and, you, and you take the warnings that were kind of like we discussed about you know like kind of iterated over you know from Eric's yeah. conversation you can avoid some of those uh those problems we use it successfully at script but we keep the scope very low we we have one service we share a database when the when the when somebody opens a pull request in, in github then a preview environment is built you know five ten minutes later they have their environment it's up and running for qa they can look at it they can see their stuff in a production like environment then when they close the pr or merge it in then it all gets wiped out so it works for us and it doesn't cost us a, a ton of money so it can be done uh, but your warnings are well noted i yeah. think it's, it's yeah. good to note those ones sure. i think also like if you, if you scoped it to one service and you're not depending on like uh, multiple services to, to test one feature it is like a, an engineering mentality thing like if we agreed on on like um, like uh, like if we are doing like TDD or something like we we, we can like this API uh, it returns some sort of response if, if it is okay I don't have like to test the whole flow like I don't have to test the five services working together to, to see the feature I can just test one it, like in the scope of the view environments like you, you can test the whole the whole setup on the staging environment like, but for view environment we can just scope it to one service that will simplify everything. <laughs> 